Jesus.
Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Scott Cobra. It's good to gather with you in worship. I've been away for a, a little bit, and so it's good to come back from vacation. We were on mountain time last Sunday. I recommend some mountain time if, you, if you'd like to. What's best about mountain time is that then you can leave it behind and be uh, thankful for coming back home to, uh, to Iowa. So it's good to be back among you after some time away. One of the most satisfying aspects of ministry for me is helping create a place and a space for people to belong in the church. That's whether someone's been a longtime member or they're just new to, uh, to the community and are looking for a place to, to belong. I like that aspect of making a place for people to belong and be a part of our church family. Um, that's not just on me, but that's on all of us to, to make that possible for, for people to feel uh, that they belong. And, and your part in that this summer is to, to each one reach one. That is, each one invites somebody new to be a part of our fellowship, uh, whether it's coming to worship or attending one of the activities of the church. Um, just a, a good, good practice for, for each of us to consider. How do we make them a part of, uh, of things on a Sunday morning? How does each one reach one? The truth is, it can be difficult to become a part of the church, to feel like you belong. That's not the easiest thing to do, uh, to become a part of the church and, uh, and feel as though you're part of the community. And so today we're gonna be looking at a scripture, Galatians chapter three, in which Paul speaks to this notion of belonging and how we are adopted into the family, which is a, a beautiful metaphor for understanding our connecting with the life of the church and our faith. So today, let's, let's look at that head on, looking at belonging and how we might be a part of making that real for all. Welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. Good. So, I want to show you guys something. What is this? A it is a library card. It's my library card, not yours, but it's mine. What, what do we get with this library card? Books, video games, movies, um, audio books, right? There's a lot of different stuff there. And comic books, you can do that too. Yep. How much is it to get a library card? It's free. 
It's free, yeah. So every time we go into the library and we check out a book or a movie or a video game and anything else that we want to do in the library, it's completely free. So when you become a member of the library, all the benefits that they have to offer, we get that. And I think that a library card is a perfect representation of what it's like to be a part of God's family. So when we become baptized, which you guys got baptized, you guys then became members of God's family, right? And how much did it cost us to become members of God's family? It was free, right? So now, just like with the library card, any type of benefit and any of the promises that God made, we get those free. Yes, and I love that thought, knowing that because I am baptized, I am a member of God's family. We are all children of God, right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to let you guys pick a little snack. Yes. I still believe that you are God's children. Okay. Yep. Okay, so let's get in the attitude of prayer. Dear Father, we are thankful that we can become your children through faith in Jesus Christ. And we are thankful that it doesn't matter who we are. And we are thankful that in Christ, we are God's children. Amen. Thank you, Jenna. What a great reminder. Appreciate that. Good morning. I'm Pastor Karen. It's good to be here with you this morning. It's good to have Scott back, don't you think? You're supposed to say yes. Yeah, they're, say, they all, they're, they're nodding. Yeah. We're glad you got vacation, but we're glad you came back too. So um, I just want to draw your attention to the good news. Summer is that time when we are kind of coming and going with other, th- other things going on. So we want to make sure you know what's going on here. Like next week is the Sturgis Falls celebration for Cedar Falls, kind of a big deal here. Um, We will only have one worship next Sunday. That will be at 10 a.m. here, okay? So if you come next Sunday at 11 o'clock, you're gonna be kind of lonely, okay? So um, 10 o'clock next Sunday here, and then the following week, which is 4th of July, is the same thing. One service that weekend at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary. So just make sure you remember that. Also with Sturgis Falls, um, the parade is next Saturday, and that all happens right here in our neighborhood, right outside our doors. So we want to have our church open for hospitality so that people can use restrooms while they're waiting um, to for the, in the staging area there. Also that there's a place that if they need to come in and cool down or warm up, depending on what the weather is that day, um, we are available for that. So our church will be open, the gathering space. If you are out and about this week and you remember um, to pick up maybe a case of water or something like that and if you would like to drop it off, that way we'll have water that we can get cold and, and hand out to people as well. So what a great opportunity for us to um, offer that hospitality to our community. Also, I just want to remind you, um, I know you know this, but I think we all forget to sign in on the the welcome pads that are in the pews. That kind of helps us to to know and to remember who's been with us each Sunday. And also, I remind you of the prayer request cards that are at the entryway of the church. If there is a joy or concern that you would like to share, either with us as a congregation or the prayer um, chain or the um, just for pastors and staff, let us know and and, um, we will... I'll make sure that those get to where they need to be and they will be prayed over. So again, I'm good to be with all of you this morning and welcome to worship. Be still and know that I am God. Let peace embrace your heart. Be still and know that I am God. Let fear and anguish now depart. Though the earthquakes rage, though the tempests roll, Though the storms conspire to destroy, be still and know that I am God. 
Thank you, Bevan. Thank you, Hannah. That's beautiful. Forgot to mention when I was up here earlier, happy Father's Day. It's good to have fathers with us today. As we come to our time of prayer, Corin has asked for prayers um, for her dad, James. He is in the hospital since Wednesday with pneumonia, and he also has lung cancer. Corinne, we, continue, we will continue in prayer with you and your family during this time. Also prayers for those that are part of our church family with ongoing health concerns. We pray for Josh Bloomker, Donna Cuvelier, Jerry Fogelman, Alice Heisey, Dorothy Isaacson, Tony Lake, Bill Minx, Carol Nicholson, Chuck Rodebush, Dorothy Schwab, Janet Simpson, Philip Smith, Nick Teig, and Marlene Thurman. Under hospice care, Colleen Crow. Hospitalized, Sue DeBauer, at Mercy One for rehab, and Dennis Knapp, rehabbing at New Aldea. And our sympathies go out to Rowena Hardinger, and to her family on the death of her brother, Dr. Benjamin Myers Lincoln, on May 31st. Also to Sherry King on the death of her father, Jim, on May 9th, and her mother, Kathy, on June 8th. Joe Bohr for the death of his stepfather, Leo Casalina, on June 11th. And the family and friends of Doris Carlson. Doris passed away this past week. Her service will be Tuesday at 10 a.m. at Richardson's Funeral Home. With those people on our hearts and in honor of our fathers, will you join me in prayer? God, for our fathers who have given us life and love, that, they, that we may show them respect and love, we pray to you, O oh God. For fathers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope and their family and friends support and console them, we pray to you, O oh God.
for men, though without children of their own, who are like fathers, have nurtured and cared for us. We pray to you, O God. For fathers who have been unable to be a source of strength, who have not responded to their children and have not sustained their families, we pray to you, O God. Gracious God, adopt us into your family through the church's sacrament of baptism that we may find our place in your love, seeking ways to love you and neighbor throughout our lives, reaching out to the needs of others and creating here in this place an atmosphere that welcomes and encourages the growth of faith. We pray to you, O God, and join now in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I said earlier, belonging is a very important aspect of being the church together. Whether you like to admit it or not, we all desire to be a part of something greater than ourselves. Belonging is a part of that. And in the church, we can feel like we're a part of belonging to something that's important, that matters, that makes a difference in the world. We've been looking at... uh, Over the summer, we've been looking at how our membership um, classes, what should be the format of those. We're looking to kind of revamp uh, the way that we've had new membership classes, and uh, in part to to make it a a little less, I guess, the number of classes that one takes, you know, that it it was uh, just this past fall we were doing it in six weeks that it took, and we're wondering if that's really necessary to have it take that long. So critics of that would say that, well, if you make it shorter, um, perhaps you're making it too easy to become a member of the church. 
Of course, I would disagree with that. I would disagree with the notion that you can ever make it too easy to, to become a member of a church because one of the most difficult things in the world is joining a church. Actually, showing up for the first time, crossing a threshold for the first time into a church can be the most difficult act that anybody can do when you do that either alone or as a family to, to become a part of and even just showing up can be difficult, right? So a new member class, no matter how long they are, may be too long because it needs to be uh, a bit more of a, a way of welcoming people. And how best can we do that? How can we help people um, be welcomed and belong to our fellowship? What's the right length of number of classes that it takes to become a member? We have those uh, membership uh, Sundays in which after they've taken those classes, we, we have them all stand up here and then they face all of your smiling faces. Well, hopefully they're smiling faces. And, and they uh, turn and they look at everyone. And by the way, that's the most difficult thing. Some people are so petrified of actually facing a group of people that they don't know well. And, uh, and that can be a very difficult thing to do, to, to stand there in front of, of all of you. So... Um, making that connection. And then, you know, a few months later, people begin to ask, where did that family, where did that couple go? We haven't seen them since they joined, really. See, that's why I say that belonging and becoming a part of a church can be one of the most difficult things for any of us to partake in. It's true for those who are even coming back, returning after, have you heard about this pandemic thing that was going on? Yeah, that coming back, um, been online. So if you're online this morning, it's great to have you online. I enjoy it myself at times, but hey, come on back. It, the water's fine, right? We can all tell you here that the water's fine. Belonging is something that we're discussing this morning. How do we belong in the church. What does that look like? The image that Paul uses in our scripture this morning is the image of adoption. Through faith in Christ, we are all adopted into the family, he describes. Take a listen with me for the word of God found here in Galatians chapter 3, starting at verse 23. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be reckoned as righteous by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to the promise. Thanks be to God for this reading of Holy Scripture. Paul uses a, a metaphor here of adoption, heirs of the family. You become that in adoption. And that's the image that he's using, the metaphor. I think that's called metaphoraging, by the way. I, I love metaphoraging, looking for metaphors. Uh, I, I, I look for that all the time in my preaching. Uh, if it's not a word, I'm hoping that you'll agree with me and we can make it a word, metaphoraging. Um, we, uh, we should do that more often. The image, the metaphor of adoption is one in which the adoptive love of God is found in Christ, and you and I are beloved children in the family of God. Paul says that after what happened in the life, the teaching, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, there is no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male or female, for all of you are in Christ Jesus. When I was on vacation um, this past week with family uh, last Sunday morning, I, I, like to, uh, I like the fact that there's online ministry because, you know, there's an opportunity to connect with, uh, with different 
um, worship services, and, and so I was doing that last Sunday. I, I was able, I was on mountain time. We were in North Dakota. We can talk about whether or not you should go to North Dakota, but um, I was on mountain time, and I recommend mountain time. It's a, it's a good thing for everyone to have an opportunity to be on mountain time and then return to Iowa, and uh, you kind of appreciate what you what you experience in Iowa. We were on vacation, and last Sunday morning, um, while on vacation, I was able to, to kind of tune in to some other um, pastors. Actually, I was looking at some United Methodist pastors that have helped me um, realize that there, there's a future for the United Methodist Church, because if these folks are helping lead the church, I want to be a part of United Methodism still because of folks like these that I, were, I was tuning into last Sunday. The first was United Methodist Pastor um, McGray de Vega. He's the lead pastor at Hyde Park United Methodist Church in Tampa Bay, Florida. He was actually giving his Pentecost sermon. I thought it was June 12th sermon, and then it turned out it was June 5th sermon. But that's okay. That, that worked for me because Pentecost was such a powerful uh, image and, and uh, you know, metaphor that I was impressed with what he had to do with Pentecost, and in fact, I wished I had had an opportunity to listen to his sermon so that I could have used some of his material on Pentecost. Pentecost, he suggests, is all about the inclusion of more people into the early church. How, in ever-widening circles, more people were becoming part of the the following of Christ, and that that was the invitation of the early church at Pentecost. There's all those, um, all those hard nationalities to name, and uh, I usually skip those verses, actually, on Pentecost, because it's so hard to say Parthians, Medes, Elementites, and, you know, I, can, I always get tumbled around on all those nationalities, but what he points out is that it was an inclusion of an ever-widening circle within the Roman Empire that people were included in the church. And that's what happened at Pentecost, says McGray de Vega, and I really think he's on to something there. That it continues in the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 10. Peter opens the church to all people who eat non-kosher foods. In chapter 15, the Gentiles are all welcomed in, which is thank goodness for you and I, because if you were not Jewish, you weren't to be a part of the church. But in chapter 15, they finally figured out that all could be a part of the fellowship of following Christ. Pentecost reveals the church as ever-inclusive. The second inspirational preacher, I was tuning in to YouTube, our YouTube channel here at First United Methodist Church and caught uh, Pastor Karen's preaching and your celebration of Vacation Bible School last week. I, I hope you were able to tune into that or be here last Sunday as we celebrated our children and, and uh, their opportunity to... Uh, to share back with us from Vacation Bible School. In that message that, that Karen preached, um, she talked about how VBS is such an important ministry and about how Jesus was always being inclusive um, where the rest of the culture was being exclusive. The, the work of Jesus' ministry was to include and include even people who were outside, who were considered non-persons, children didn't have status in the first century. And so she suggested that that was really about how to include children, invite the children to come to me, was Jesus' teaching there. And she expounded on, on that ministry of, of reaching out, making them part of the kingdom. And then the third was, uh, was actually a little bit of research I was doing for today's message. Um, it was uh, the teaching of Professor Guy Nave, he's an ordained um, United Methodist and uh, clergy, and he's a professor of religion at Luther College. He had an essay on Juneteenth. I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Juneteenth, but it's now a national holiday. This is the second year that it'll be a federal holiday. Juneteenth will be celebrated uh, tomorrow. I guess we won't have any mail being delivered on the second year of Juneteenth being a federal holiday. Juneteenth honors June 19th, 1865, when slaves in Texas were shared the message that they were no longer slaves, that they were no longer to be bound in slavery. Major General Gordon Granger on June 19th, 1865 in Galveston, Texas, proclaimed this to, to those um, slaves in Texas. Of course, 
this had actually happened two and a half years prior to June 19th, 1865, in the rest of the country, but it hadn't gotten word to the people of Texas, or I should say that the, the uh, leadership of Texas did not honor what Abraham Lincoln had done in the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. So there were still 250 slaves in Texas that were enslaved and continued to be under slavery. And it didn't change until June 19th of 1865 when the military came to enforce the proclamation of emancipation. Guy Nave points out that the state of Texas was the last stronghold of resistance. The abolition of slavery is not the same thing as freedom. And it's certainly not the same thing as belonging in the fullest way. That's what makes it so interesting that in the time of Paul that he would actually say there are no longer free or slave. He was saying that in the first century, proclaiming what Abraham Lincoln had to restate in 1863 to the people of the United States that there should no longer be people who are slave. That's what Juneteenth is commemorating and honoring is that freedom that was offered to those black people in Texas that had not heard the news, had not received their freedom. It has something to do with an authentic belonging that Paul offers in scripture that we look at today. For Paul, these distinctions, distinctions that have been made throughout the ages and were prominent in his time, Jew and Greek, there is no longer a difference between the two in Christ. There's no longer a difference between free and slave with Christ. There is no longer a difference of male and female, he even suggests. It's an amazing love of inclusion that Paul is offering, an act of God's grace that we have been brought into the family in Christ. The problem is we have a, a problem living up to the ideals that even Paul was proclaiming to the Galatians. We still have problems living up to the ideals. Christians look around and see that Paul's vision of what God's ideal community would look like have not actually ended up in the world being the way we live always. And the church is to be a haven for that to be the truth within our fellowship, that all are welcome, all are a part of the faith. Even in the 21st century, we need to hear Galatians anew. The third chapter of Galatians, it's a big deal. It's a big deal today, just as it was in Paul's day. Can you imagine the pushback he received when he said that these three Divided groups were actually to be included in the Christian faith. Jew and Greek should be included. That free and slave should be included as Christian. That male and female is not a way to divide ourselves any longer. Maybe Galatians 3.29 should be elevated to the status of John 3.16. I wonder what that would look like if we held 3.29 in the same esteem as we do John 3.16. John Wesley once wrote a sermon in which he, uh, he used a, a metaphor that was kind of interesting, uh, that uh, strangers coming to this world was the metaphor. So he was talking about aliens. Uh, I'm like, what, what is John Wesley talking about aliens for in the 18th century? But he says, if a stranger from another world came and observed us, What would they believe is the purpose of life by looking at us? What would they say is the the most important thing by watching and observing us? And Wesley said that what he, he thought people would see if they were aliens from another world, they would see that we focus our lives on gratifying our desires. And he says... Actually, the opposite is to be the truth about us as followers of Christ. In fact, time is too short on earth, says Wesley, that we really don't have time to focus our attention on anything other than pursuing our relationship 
with God. Pursuing that relationship is the most important thing, but what people would observe is our pursuing our desires as being the most important thing. Wesley calls our relationship with God as the one thing needful, the one thing needful in a person's life. It's not success in your career. It's not the largest bank account in the neighborhood. It's not uh, being the perfect mother or father. It's not the greatest looking yard in the neighborhood, which at one point I thought was actually the truth. And it certainly isn't having the ideal home that makes that the case. That's not the one thing needful that we need to pursue. The one thing needful, Wesley says, is for us to open ourselves up to being the person that God created us to be. That relationship with God in Christ is the ultimate belonging. That is the one thing needful for us. For this we were created. For this Jesus Christ came to lead us to a wholeness of life and to experience the grace of God. As Jesus once said on on another occasion, you did not choose me, but I chose you. We often get that mixed up and think that we do all the choosing. Christ chose you. We just get in tune with what has already been chosen. In Christ, we, who at times act like nobodies, have become somebodies in Christ. We are adopted Jesus stretched out his arms to include, to embrace all of us. I was adopted, you were adopted, part of the family. In Christ, that's the extension of grace offered to us. You're special, we're all special in our own way. We are created to be the person God has created us to be, and we ought to be treated as such. Now let's consider again that, uh, that group of people that, uh, you know, sometimes it's on a November Sunday. They, they stand up here, they, they profess that they are going to become a part of our fellowship and, and a part of our congregation. And then we don't necessarily see some of them. What, what is going on there for, for them? I've, I've often wondered about them. And sometimes I get fixated on the impression that, well, maybe they're bitter. They're upset in some way. And uh, they just, uh, they don't really connect with us. There's some resistance within them. United Methodist professor of preaching at uh, Iliff Seminary, Tom Trauger, um, he says that in dealing with such folks, folks that you feel are resistant or somehow haven't made a connection, that uh, perhaps we shouldn't look at them as someone who's difficult to live with, but we should look at them as someone who is homesick. That changes things for me. When I think of somebody who's homesick, they haven't found their home in the place where they reside. That person has nowhere to live. They feel like they're a cast out, that they're alone. They're somehow not at home. If you've ever dealt with someone in your family who is homesick, if you've ever known a friend or someone who just doesn't feel like where they are is home for them any longer, it can be a difficult thing to help them shift their thinking and to overcome their homesickness. But the church should be a place where belonging and home is offered It's a ministry that's so important for us to be about. It encompasses hospitality and welcome, all those aspects that are important and are a part of our Christian faith. Sometimes we have to make a space, a home for others. We must give them the secure sense that they belong, that they count for something, that they can make a difference in our family. They need to know that here they are at last at home, that there is a place for them. 
One last thing that I want to take up with, uh, with what Paul says here in Galatians is this, uh, this mention of baptism that he shares. He comments that Christians are baptized into Christ. In the United Methodist Church, when we celebrate a baptism, we are all reminded, all the congregation who is gathered in that, uh, that, that worship service are all reminded of their Christian faith and their commitment to continue their relationship with God and the importance of their encouraging this newly baptized one as well. In baptism, God says to each of us who are baptized that I have come to you, I have sought you, I have found you, and I will bring you home. You are now a part of the family, adopted into the family of God through baptism. In baptism, we find our home, we find our adoption, we find that we belong. This, my friends, is a great mystery of faith. What Paul is speaking of, what the church is called to be about, but it's a good news. It's a good news for each of us that we receive the gift of baptism that we might be part of the family of God. We're all home. We're all adopted. We belong. So be it, and may it be so. Would you stand and join with us in singing our closing hymn? We've gathered for worship that we might realize that we can center our lives in God, that we are companioned with Christ, and that the Holy Spirit guides us and comforts us on our journey. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.